Uh, the title of my presentation today is Women on the Front Lines for Women, a Closer Look at All-Female UN Peacekeeping Units. And it is research based um, that is currently supported by the Peter McGrath Human Rights Fellowship Program here at UD. So before I get into to the, the all-female units particularly, I, I need to sort of lay some background information about where this comes from in my larger research agenda. Uh, my research has been largely driven by a UN Security Council resolution that was passed in 2000, uh, number 1325. And it was actually the first resolution that the UN Security Council passed related to women and gender specifically. So in 50 plus years of existence, it was the first time that the council said, oh yeah, by the way, what we do is relevant not only to the protection of women, but actually to in thinking about women's participation in the peace process and the prevention of conflict long term. And so this was a really landmark resolution uh, and had direct consequences for how the council conducts humanitarian intervention, uh, peacekeeping, and military action specifically. And it didn't just talk about women, it talked about gender perspectives in particular. So it wasn't just about women, um, but about the gender roles that um, have impacts on why conflicts start and why they endure. Uh, of course, is rooted in international law, such as the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women um, and the Beijing Platform in 1995. But this is really distinct because it happened in the Council. So up until 2000, a lot of human rights and women's issues in general, discussions in the UN occur in the G General Assembly. Let the General Assembly handle it. Let the Economic and Social Cultural um, uh, Council handle it. We in the Security Council, we deal with the hardcore security issues that, that go, take that down the hall. And so this was really significant in re sort of locating women's issues and gender equality in what is arguably the, the most powerful body of the UN. Um, but it was not without uh, consequence in the sense that the framework and the language used in the resolution, what I call the security framework and wrote a bit about um, in my first book, um, relied upon certain ideas and assumptions about the role that women played in the peace process. And so it was very much a resolution that made an instrumental argument about what women bring to peace and how the council and peacekeeping in particular can benefit from women's inclusion. Women then were an asset uh, to be included. So it wasn't just enough to talk about women's rights as women's rights or the right thing to do, but in fact they contributed to to the mission of the council. And so in some ways, while it represents, the, the, the resolution represents a humanizing of security, meaning the broadening of what we think about security to a sort of human security approach, it also in the same um, vein meant securitizing of women and gender equality. And this is something I'll talk more about in the presentation. So this is sort of research I'm building on. And what I want to present to you today is actually a new project that's um, just underway. And it's really exciting for me. We've got some initial findings to share with you. Just to give you a brief snapshot of UN peacekeeping missions um, and sort of the status of missions, it's important to note that when you look at the mandate, the UN Charter, the mandate of the, the organization, the term peacekeeping actually does not appear. It's not in the original founding document and it's an idea and a practice that has evolved significantly since its inception. Um, very quickly after the UN was established in 1948, the Council deployed its first mission in uh, 1948 to monitor the armistice agreement in the Middle East. Um, and so it was this, at this point that the idea of peacekeeping emerged officially, and it has developed since then. There has been 67 peacekeeping missions deployed to date, and, but two-thirds of those missions have occurred since the end of the Cold War. So since 1990, two-thirds of that 67 have, have occurred. And so it's, it's, um, they've grown dramatically, not just in terms of frequency, but in terms of size, in terms of personnel, and in terms of what they're tasked to do. So in, in earlier peacekeeping missions, some of which are still going on, such um, as the one in Cyprus, um, the one um, along the India and Pakistan border, those are the traditional ones. They monitor a ceasefire, right? They monitor a border. They're there as observers. But missions like the ones that have been established in Sudan now uh, and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, they're huge. And the peacekeepers are tasked with a whole range of functions from documenting human rights violations to monitoring elections to rebuilding infrastructure to rebuilding institutions such as the National Police Force. And so their, their tasks have grown immensely, but they still predominantly rely upon uniformed personnel, both police and military, military constituting a larger portion of that. 
There has been some growth in these missions with more and more police being involved as well as civilian personnel and volunteer. Um, but it still is predominantly uniformed personnel that are deployed. And they're deployed on a voluntary basis, meaning member states, UN countries, volunteer uh, members from their police or their military to be deployed into these missions. The budget is significant, but if we sort of compare it on a global scale, global military expenditures, it's about one half of one percent of what the world spends on uh, global military expenditures. And um, even at that rate, um, it, there's uh, outstanding contributions of uh, close to half. So um, lots of challenges there. All that to say that we've there have been a number of achievements with 1325, particularly in the context of peacekeeping, and I could talk about those. But one of the achievements that the UN talks about is the development of these all-female formed police units. So these aren't military, these are police. And they have been created in a context where the female presence in peacekeeping missions, the numbers are still quite dismal. So right now, female peacekeepers, about 10% um, are women. Uh, about 3% of military peacekeepers are women. And that, those numbers are actually much higher than they were 10 years ago. Uh, but they're still quite, quite low. And there's a general consensus in the UN among member states that there needs to be uh, more women included, uh, particularly given the wider mission of these, of these um, deployments. And so there's an ongoing call by member states. And there's lots of reasons why these numbers are low. First and foremost is probably the fact that when you look at national police forces and national militaries, women are, are represented in very low numbers in those institutions. So when you're drawing from institutions where um, women are already a small percentage, that of course carries over. But there are other challenges here as well in terms of recruitment um, of women into these voluntary deployments. Despite this, we've had this interesting development in the international community where um, certain countries have put together these all-female units as a way to respond to this call where we need more women. Um, and so we've had Liberia or Indian peacekeepers deployed to Liberia, an all-female Indian unit, an all-female Bangladeshi unit deployed to, East, or to Haiti, an all-female Samoan unit deployed to Timor-Leste, and a Rwandan to uh, Darfur. And while these certainly make for great photo ops, and lots of my slides will draw from these pictures. You don't have to go far. You can find these reports in the New York Times. There's not a lot of really good research on the impact of these units, both in terms of the mission mandate, in terms of the local population, and on the peacekeepers themselves. And so that's the gap that my research seeks, uh, seeks to fill. Some of my central questions then, um, first and foremost, is looking at, all right, well, so what kind of work are these all-female units doing, and how does that differ from the other units in the area and in the country that um, are predominantly or um, entirely male units, male staffed units. Um, and how, um, and that includes not only their mandated activities, but what they're doing off duty. And that's a really interesting finding that I've come into. Secondly then is of course, how do these missions, these all female units interact with local populations? How are they perceived? And thirdly, how are they perceived by other peacekeepers, right? So you hear how you have this sort of, oh, it's the all-female unit uh, on a pedestal and in some cases, which has interesting implications for the mission overall. Uh, and then, of course, how do the female peacekeepers within those units themselves experience the mission? Um, and what does it mean in terms of thinking about gender equality and women's rights in their national context? Uh, in terms of my methodology, uh, I embrace a mi very mixed method approach. Uh, including some discourse analysis, process tracing, and participant observer. I spent uh, quite a bit of time in, in New York uh, doing interviews and being a part of these um, organizations and observing Security Council meetings and such uh, to build these sort of case studies that, that I'll draw from today. Um, I also rely heavily on interviews both with UN officials past and present as well as peacekeepers themselves and NGOs that are involved in the advocacy of um, promoting women's rights in post-conflict situations in particular. So while there have been some anecdotal reports, there's been very little systematic evidence. There's lots of, um, you know, when you read the news story about these things, oh, they these, these units make the peacekeepers more accessible. Right? There's more confidence in the mission. Um, it encourages more women to get involved in the, in the mission from the local population. But it's always leaves me wondering, more compared to what? 
right? And so that's the piece that, that I'm focused on. And this is, as I said, part of a larger project. I'm actually um, currently working with a practitioner that served as a gender advisor in Liberia for a number of years, and we're putting together uh, a collaborative effort uh, to um, conduct a a multi-stage project which involves significant field work relying on her experience and connections uh, beginning uh, in Liberia before they, they draw down there in the next couple of years. Um, all right, so one of my first interesting findings in all of this actually was the lack of historical um, record of how this idea emerged. Where did it come from? Why is a segregated all-female unit a good idea if you're trying to promote more women? And it did emerge in the context of, okay, well, how are we going to better promote and implement 1325? Because five, six years, and even now 12 years after the passage of the resolution, it's fallen short in many places, right? It was a very radical resolution, had grand aspirations, and it's, it's fallen short. And so it was in those conversations where this idea emerged, primarily by an Indian ambassador. Uh, it was no surprise then that the... Um, uh, that India was actually the first to deploy an all-female unit, received quite a bit of press to Liberia in 2007. And since then, there have been five all-female units deployed, one-year deployments to Liberia, which makes for some, from a social science perspective, really nice case studies in terms of, of their experience. Um, Bangladesh uh, was then to follow with a deployment to Haiti, Samoa to Timor, Rwanda to Darfur, and now Nigeria has, has um, uh, announced that it is preparing an all-female unit likely to be deployed to Liberia, but uh, we shall see. And so I don't see this as a phenomenon going away, right? And so it's really an important one to look at, to think about in terms of peace and security. Women in uniform not only increase the talent pool per se, but when you have a, a concentrated group of women, such as these all-female units, they provide a focal point within communities where women know women locally know they can go to report crimes, to seek out assistance with sexual violence in particular. Uh, and so, we've, so there's been some evidence that that, that is em emerging as a, um, as a significant finding. Also on a very practical level, when you think about what peacekeepers do, one of the things that is sort of the first order of business in a mission is the DDR programs. DDR stands for disarmament demobilization and reintegration. And what that means is you have to take the rebel groups, the insurgency groups, you have to take their guns, you have to demobilize, you have to break them apart, and you have to reintegrate them to society. But those programs rely on a very specific idea of who is a combatant, right? Combatants are those with guns. But if you look very closely at who makes up insurgency groups, it's not just people with guns. It's cooks, it's messengers, it's wives, it's sex slaves, it's all of these things. And so, there was evidence in Sudan, for example, that women in that conversation allowed for a broader understanding of who counts as a combatant and who is in need of services, particularly in terms of demobilization and um, reintegration into society. Interestingly, in terms of capacity, is also what particularly the first Liberian group or Indian, woman, Indian unit deployed to Liberia, what they did off duty. And this was different than what we've seen in predominantly male police units in the area, in Monrovia in particular. But off-duty, they developed things like um, a defense, self-defense class, HIV-AIDS education. And in uh, conversation with those women, there was a, a real, real sense of that the security they were there to provide was much more than the physical aspect of the gun, right? And so it was a broader sense of this and getting at this idea of human security. But it does, for me, um, raise some really important questions about the goals of 1325 and sort of my overarching uh, um, research interest in terms of women's rights and, and gender equality, and whether or not more women in uniform carrying guns in the police department actually means we're moving towards peace or we're moving towards gender equality. Uh, and it doesn't do anything to question sort of the state's ongoing control of the use of force, legitimate, legitimate use of force. Um, but what there hasn't been done and what is part of the future project is to actually uh, get an understanding of whether or not peacekeepers are doing any training with local women about careers and professional aspirations. And so that's uh, next step. So my third theme that has emerged here um, gets a lot of different names civilizing effect, normalizing effect, calming effect. But here's the idea. If women are there, men behave better, right? And so um, there's lots of research on this, actually. As you can see, I've cited them all. Um, but 
from a comparative stance, there's not much there, right? Um, and so there are ways to measure this that we're looking at, right? So do reports of sexual exploitation and abuse decline? Do rates of HIV AIDS decline? Do the existence of brothels around peacekeeping missions decline if there are more women? And the truth is there's not enough presence of women yet to actually see measurable effects, but that's the direction that this needs to go. That being said, um, there is really interesting, um, my research thus far, um, did find that, that the all-female units at first have been seen as quite privileged. So when they arrived in Liberia, for example, the Indian women, they got a better unit, they got air conditioning in their unit, and they got computers that worked. And that was not the case in other police units. And so if you're thinking about these women going in and having these presents, and then you think about that situation, they are in fact very segregated in ways that are probably detrimental to the mission. Um, and so this, I think, really complicates the picture about th these all-female units being the, the, the solution to gender equality, lasting peace, these sorts of things. Um, so there were some initial reports of negative feelings towards the privileged all-female units. Lastly, of course, then it's important to talk about the experience of the female peacekeepers. And this is something where the, the case studies thus far, um, particularly in the case of um, the Indian women in Liberia, there has been a um, strong support structure that has developed over five years for the women that have been deployed, meaning Indian women do a really good job of preparing the, the next group that's going to be deployed and debriefing the group that returns. Um, and there's a real sense of solidarity among these women. And so from a recruitment standpoint, there is some interesting implications here. If, if the goal is to include more women, um, that this may be a way of doing that. They also face lower risk of sexual harassment, which is a common uh, uh, challenge within peacekeeping missions, particularly when you mix um, cultures and men and women in situations, um, unfamiliar situations. 